Good morning, church. It's good to be with you again this morning. Uh, continuing in our study of Romans, uh, we're coming towards the end of that. I think we have one more week uh, before we, uh, I believe we're going to be starting in a study of the Song of Solomons. Uh, but don't take my uh, word for that at this point in time, but I believe that's where we're headed next. Uh, I ask you to go ahead and open your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 14 today. We're going to be studying the first 12 the verses of that chapter. Uh, just for your information, I'll be reading out of the English Standard Version, uh, but you can use whatever Bible you have with you. Uh, just follow along with me if you would. Now, last week, in Jerry led the lesson. We were in Romans uh, 13, and he was talking about Christians as in our role as citizens of this world in which we live. Uh, Paul this week turns from that topic of our general role within the population to the specific role of how we deal with fellow Christians within the church. How to deal with believers, particularly when there is disagreement over issues within the church body. Now, for clarity, I want the at the onset to say these were not doctrinal issues. Uh, when it comes to the issues of doctrine, the Bible gives us our clarity. And uh, we should always hold tight on those doctrinal issues. But rather, these disagreements were on things that had arisen around the practices of the church. And a lot of those differences came because of the diversity within the church. Uh, Particularly, it seems to have been around the melding of believers that were coming out of a Jewish background. And we know the Jewish background has tons of traditions that go along with it. Versus those that were coming from Gentile backgrounds. Uh, totally, so there were totally different cultural issues there. In each instance, their backgrounds helped form their thoughts around things, how things should be done within the church. Now, and we'll discuss some of those things as we go through the passage here. Well, you may be saying, how could that relate to me? We're very much alike culturally. Yes, we are. We, uh, most of our church, you know, we're uh, largely a southern church. Uh, we've been a Baptist church for 160, 70 years now. Uh, so our backgrounds are very similar and yet we do find cultural differences and educational differences there's all kinds of differences we find within our body that sometimes leads to disagreements on how we should do things and we have a, a current example of that a living example today uh, our church along with every other church in the country is dealing with the issue of how do we come back together physically for services in light of where we are with the, the coronavirus. And people seem to fall pretty strongly into one of two camps on that issue. Uh, I would say you have the faith camp. Uh, those that say we should have reopened yesterday. Uh, and you hear statements from people that belong to this camp so that go something like this. Uh, God numbered our days before we were born. There's nothing that we can do that will change that, so why should we worry about it? Or you just need to have faith that God is going to protect you in this. Or those who don't want to open are operating under a mindset of fear. Getting a little more challenging uh, to those who might have a different view. Uh, you may hear them say, let those come who want to come. If others want to stay home, well, that's their choice. Well, and then you hear the other camp that I'm going to call the godly wisdom camp. They have more of an attitude of be cautious as we move forward. You may hear statements from this group somewhere along these lines. Well, do you jump out in front of a bus just because God's pre-numbered your days? Or... My faith in God's protection 
includes the use of the wisdom that he has given me. Or those who want to open are testing God rather than seeking his guidance. Or maybe this. You say your choice doesn't impact me. So, but that is ignoring the reality of how disease spreads. And the Bible says that we are our brother's keeper. We're not going to settle that debate today. As a matter of fact, I don't even want to go into it. I just wanted to use it as an example of how, even in the current world, these disagreements among the body, we need to look for biblical guidance on how to resolve. What should our attitude be towards our fellow believers when we come to those points of disagreement? Uh, unity is easy when we agree. But what about when we don't? So, let's begin by looking at our passage. Uh, again, we're in Romans 14. We're going to be in verses 1 through 12. And again, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and not let the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day is better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be both Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Well, you see some disagreement in there. And then Paul addressing it with them. Uh, let's look at those first verses, verses 1 through 4. Uh, and let's get some background on what was going on here. Uh, we see a dietary issue that was going on. It was around the eating of meat. Particularly, it was around the eating of meat that might have been offered at a sacrifice. Uh, this meat could be found for sale in the marketplaces much cheaper than you could get meat anywhere else at that point in time. And there were two groups that had different views of the appropriateness of the consumption of this meat. Well, using my example of camps again, we would say we have the Freedom in Christ camp. We would probably consider these mature believers ourselves. Uh, they understood the truth that meat offered at sacrifice was no longer, yeah, that offering had no meaning. Uh, the God that it was offered to is false. Uh, there was only one sacrifice which ever mattered, and that was the sacrifice of Christ upon the cross. Any other sacrifice simply resulted in cheap meat being made available. There was no sin in consuming it. But then you had the traditions camp. And there were really two groups in this camp. There were the Jews. Those who were having a hard time letting go of their traditions that were based on the rites 
and the uh, prohibitions that existed under the Old Testament law. Uh, and that would have included the offering of the consumption of the of meat that had been offered. Uh, they would, it would have been considered unholy. Then there were the Gentiles who had been raised on all, side, all sorts of idol worship uh, that included the giving of meat sacrifices and they viewed the consumption of that meat as, as potentially sinful uh, because of the way that it had been used. Uh, they were uh, set back in their own minds because of that. So it's clear from the text that Paul believed in the concept of freedom in Christ because he called the vegetarians the weaker persons in the text if you go back. But he doesn't dwell on that issue of right or wrong. Rather, he came to the stressing of unity in the body as being more important than the issue of the meat itself. He says, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. Don't worry about the fact that he disagrees with you on the concept of the consumption of meat. That is not a primary issue that you need to be dealing with. Now the Greek word that's translated welcome here means a personal and a willing acceptance of another. Uh, Paul is saying the common belief that you have with this person who may disagree with you on other things, this belief in the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is the defining issue for who becomes my brother and who I need to treat as a brother. If that common issue exists, we're to welcome people into the body. Despite of what other weaknesses or differences we may see in their walk. And beyond merely welcoming, welcoming them, we need to do so without becoming quarrelsome with them. Uh, you've probably heard the, the term, we need to disagree without becoming disagreeable. Well, that is applicable here. Using the issue of meat consumption as the example, Paul goes on to both of these camps and saying, no matter which side of this issue you follow, neither despise or pass judgment on the other. Now that's hard for some of us, isn't it? By nature, we don't want to be simply right in our own mind. We want acknowledgement from everyone around us that, yes, you were right on this. I mean, I love a good debate. Uh, I took debating in high school. Uh, I judged debating. Uh, even did a little of it in college. I love it when I find someone who is just as hard-headed as I am. Uh, my son, Clay, took after me in that respect, and we could really get into it sometimes. Uh, Susie and Ryan would just sit back and shake their heads at us. For Clay and me, it was a game. It was fun. But I have to be very careful that I don't take that same attitude and that same mindset into discussions with other people who don't share in my view of debate as a game, uh, who take it more seriously than that. There's two very important reasons that this passage lays out for being careful about disrespecting other people's attitudes on things. One, it can affect how each of us view the other person. Verse 3 says, not to despise the one who disagrees with me. The meaning of that word that's translated despise here indicates making a value judgment about that person. In effect, it's saying that I'm placing the value of that person as being less than myself. Well, that's pride. That's let, letting pride enter into my view of others because of the way they disagree with me. Uh, the Bible tells me uh, I'm supposed to be humble. But pride is a lack of that humility. And there's a lack of admission that I needed grace every bit as much as that other person. Because I wasn't correct in all my views either. 
And I'm still not correct in all my views. And I need to recognize that. Verse 3 also says not to pass judgment. Literally, it means, passing judgment means not to condemn someone. Uh, don't condemn them because I come to a point of contempt of them because they disagree with me on an issue. Don't be exclusive of them. When we do this, we're going back into what uh, God criticized the Old Testament uh, priests for. Uh, for being legalistic and self-righteous in the way that they do things. Verse 3 concludes with a very clear statement of why it's wrong for me to be either despising or passing judgment on others. It says, for God has welcomed him. Who am I to set aside someone that God has welcomed into his church? Not my church, into his church. Verse 4 continues with the explanation of why my attitude may need to be corrected. It says, I am not the master of my fellow believers. Only the Lord stands in that position. I, I'm simply a servant. Just like you and just like any other believer in the church. No matter what position they may hold within the church. Whether it be the pastor, the deacon, the teacher, or any other position of influence that someone might hold. My fellow believers must answer only to their master. And it isn't me. So who am I to try and push myself into God's position as a judge. I have no authority. I'm a servant. I serve the same master they do. And am I forgetting that God has already deemed that they're going to be able to stand before Him one day? Not because of anything that I may do to influence them in their life, but purely because of what Christ has done. They will stand on the same basis before their God that I will. On Christ and Christ alone. Now I'm going to point out here again that this passage is not talking about issues of false doctrine and unchristian behavior. Those things need to be confronted in the church. This is talking about issues of lesser importance where we need to exercise grace and acceptance not judgment and disdain. Consider, what are issues in the church that stir you to a point of agitation? We probably all have some. Something that when we see it, it just tears you up inside and you feel that you've got to jump out and say something. Well, how do you think Paul would have addressed those same issues in a letter that if he was writing it to you today? Would he tell you the same things that he told these believers in the early Roman church? Uh, again, not doctrinal issues, not unchristian behavior, just issues of differences. Okay, well let's go on and let's look at verses uh, 5 through 8. I would call this section honoring God. Here we're seeing another struggle between the same, within the same body that's playing out as an issue in their church. And it's related to, again, to the Jewish and Gentile believers and their past. It says, one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day, observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. So, the Jews were coming from a tradition where their Sabbath was observed on Saturday the seventh day of the week. This was in honor of God's plan of creation where he created for six days and then he rested on the seventh. 
that seventh became a Sabbath, a day of rest for them. The Jewish also had a bunch of festivals. Uh, they were scattered throughout the year, and they had been considered holy based on the Old Testament commands that God had given. So, coming out of that, these Jewish worshipers were still clinging a little bit to that Jewish tradition of these are the holy days that we need to be observing. Now, the Gentiles, on the other hand, were coming out of idolatrous practices that had been set into the traditions of the society that they were living in. And they were widely celebrated within that Roman society. And then you have this issue of the early Christian church making a move towards worshiping on Sunday, the first day of the week, in honor of that being the day that Christ rose from the dead. And you put all those issues together, and you see this conflict arising over the church over a very basic of issue of when should we gather together to worship? Well, Paul then combines that issue with the issue of the meat that we were discussing earlier, and he gives two additional pieces of guidance to this church body. The first is found in verse 5. Each should be fully convinced in his own mind. Paul is saying it is not the practice itself, but it is your understanding of why you personally are holding to that practice that determines whether it is proper or not. It is a personal matter. It's not a congregational matter. Paul expounds on this position later in verse 22, if you wanted to skip down to there, where he says, The faith you have, keep between yourself and God. Again, he's stressing the personal nature of your walk with God that needs to have priority over the issue of complete agreement on practices within the church. In summary, know why you believe what you believe. Don't take my word for it. Don't take anybody else's word on what you should believe. Be in God's word. Draw your own conclusions and know why you believe what you believe. That's the first piece of guidance. The second piece of guidance Paul gives to the church is found in verse 6. He says, does it honor God? If the act of a fellow worshiper, a fellow believer, is meant to bring honor of God to God, regardless of whether it falls in line with my personal beliefs, then it should be appreciated by me. Again, it's not my position to judge or look down on someone just because they practice their faith differently than me. The summary of verses 5 and 6 seems to go back to one question. In the heart of the person performing the act, is their intent in their practice to bring honor to God? If so, don't judge them. So let's look at verses 7 and 8 again. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. In these verses, Paul seems to go back to the discussion that he began in verses 3 and 4. Who are you to judge another household's servant. The answer is the same. I'm responsible only for myself and for my master, my relation to my master. But there seems to be an even broader question that's being raised here, a question that should lead each of us back to a little bit of self-evaluation. Yes, I'm called to live for Christ, but do I also recognize that that call includes a willingness to die 
for Christ? Does my commitment to the call of Christ consciously include a willingness to suffer even to the point of death? Paul recognized this in a passage elsewhere when he wrote, To live is Christ, to die is gain. So, if we look for application within our life for this, does our handling of disagreements, even within the body of the church, bring honor to God by the way we handle them? And if not, what part do I need to play in changing that attitude within our church body? Okay, let's move on to verses 9 through 12. Uh, I'll just call this, We Will Stand. In this final section of our lesson, Paul reminds the church that we all have something in common. Starting in verse 9. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Are you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue will confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. So verse 9 makes it plain that whether you are part of the redeemed in heaven or you're still part of the church on earth, Christ died for you. And in doing so, he has made a claim, a rightful claim to be, the posi to be in the position of Lord, Master, over your life. We often talk about our freedom in Christ and we value that freedom in Christ and rightfully so because we are free from the penalty of our sin. But we often ignore the fact that in that same moment that we received that freedom in Christ we chose to enslave ourselves to Him by accepting Him as Lord. Now, our Master is a good and loving Master. We could ask for no better. But He's still Master. And sometimes we won't forget that. He is working for our good. Paul had, had elaborated to that fact back in chapter 6 and uh, 22-23. When he said, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, again, our master, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our life of walking in the way of our Master's guidance, fulfilling His commands is for our good. We use this word sanctification. Sanctification is being changed to be more like Christ every day as we go through our life. And that's what He's saying here. Serve your Master to be sanctified. And then in verse 10, He reminds me that I have no standing to become an obstacle in the rightful relationship between another believer and their Lord. They are my brother and sister in Christ, but they are Christ's slave. They're not mine. I have no basis and I cannot rightfully judge them. I will stand before the Lord for my rightful judgment, and so will they. Verse 12 contains a quote from the book of Isaiah that we're all very familiar with. It says, Every knee shall bow to me and every tongue will confess. And we've probably learned that in our memory. Confess that I am Lord. Uh, so the question here is, are you ready to give an account of yourself to God? Let's be clear. This is not the moment of judgment on where 
of whether or not you're eligible to enter into heaven. Christ resolved that issue for you. If you know him, that ticket is stamped. But you are going to be called upon to give an account of how you use the life that Christ gave to you. That God, God did not take you away when you were saved. He left you here for a purpose. And that was to live the righteous life that He has called you to. And He's going to call you to account for that when you stand before Him. Do you want your account to be filled with instances of how you bickered with your brothers and sisters over things of no eternal significance? Your brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you want to explain how someone might have turned away from finding Christ because what he saw taking place within the walls of the church did not seem to be holy and righteous. I don't want that. And I know you don't either. So, let's choose to build each other up rather than tear each other down when we come to points of disagreement. I'd summarize the challenge from today's lesson like this. Believers are to honor God regardless of what doing so may require. One way to do that in practical terms is to recognize the efforts of others who are also striving to please God, striving to honor Him, even if our ways of doing so are different between us. We can enjoy freedom to serve God as He leads us, but we also must allow others that very same privilege, freedom in their worship of their God. Our rights do not extend so far as to trample the practices that others may have that honor God within their own hearts. Our faith in God should guide us to act and treat others in the same way that He guides us through the example of Christ, through the truths of His Word, and through the actions of the Holy Spirit working within us. Let's pray in closing. Father, Lord, I thank you for this passage. I thank you for Paul's writing to the Roman church. And Lord, I do find, pray that we find application uh, within our lives. We know that division within the church over issues that are not issues of doctrine, that are not an issues of unchristian living, but sometimes those things become hot and heated within the discussions of the church body. Lord, let us remember that you gave us freedom to worship and honor you differently within our lives. You made us different, Lord. You didn't make us all the same. The differences that dwell within us are part of your grand creation. And Lord, you love the diversity that is there. The diversity in lifestyles, the diversity in thought processes. Lord, you just want us to dwell in our relationship with you and honor you and love you through the way we do that. And Lord, you expect us to honor our brothers and sisters in the same way. Not putting ourselves in the position of being their judge. Not taking your place in that. But Lord, to build them up and to help them that they can walk holy before you. That we can stand before you at the end and we can hear those words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Lord, that is my prayer today, and I know that it is also the prayer of those that are listening. Thank you again for this time in your word. Bless us in the week ahead. We ask for these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, the Christ. Amen. Thank you. hope you enjoyed the lesson this week, that you'll be back with us next week.